Bible in the beginning. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, not only did he I really, he really cleaned it up though. This mm -hmm. little more story though. No, but it was a very pow It's funny that you say that because that he's one of the few people that actually depicted the story of Solomon and Gomorrah. I'm yeah, sorry. that's true. And he did it in a way that, again, if you can go back and I'm not even sure, like, let me find out where you can see it. Yeah, it was on uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon. So, well, it's a very long movie, Sunday morning and afternoon. On what channel? It was called the Movies Channel or something. Um, I'm wondering, I'm going to tell you right now where you can watch it. Um, it was called The Bible in the Beginning. It came out in 66. But I will tell you this, that um, there were things that he did in that movie that were, uh, that I think were quite groundbreaking. And also, I mean, there's parts of it that people, you know, can make fun of. Some of it's overacted. You got Abraham, if you recall, is George C. Scott, which is an right. interesting choice. John Huston himself plays Noah, which I thought was an yeah. interesting choice. Yeah. And Richard Harris. Yeah, and Richard Harris. Good. Richard Harris and Franco Nero play uh, Cain and Abel. So um, it was, but the, but the scene of Sodom and Gomorrah in that, or maybe I, it's too little. Yeah, too we long. actually saw uh, that part. We weren't able to see the whole, whole movie, but we saw part of it. That it, it that if you look at that part, it's, I mean, I, I don't remember how old I was when I saw it, but it was so, you can watch it on Apple TV or Prime, Amazon Prime for $3.99. You can watch it. Uh, it was it was dramatically like like visually powerful and very very like i can still remember the scenes in it of the i don't want to get into it now but i won't ruin the story but i still remember the images and the and the visuals from that from that sodom and gomorrah scene it, it stuck with me for a long time i know i was yeah a, I, I thought i, I thought was he was a did a really good job yep no, I know well, I was done when I saw it, but I, it definitely stayed with me. And it was just Genesis. It was just, uh, it was, just wasn't it? It was only. It said it was only. I didn't watch the whole thing, but it, it ended at the binding of, of uh, Isaac. Isaac. Yeah, which is pretty much where we're getting to now. So it's like half of it. It's not even. I have a feeling he probably was going to do a. It was probably going to do a second half of that, but it's very hard. It was. It was. Um, let me just see if they were ever supposed to do a second. Uh, critical reception. Some people said it was, I don't know. It was, did very well in Italy. It was also produced, uh, it was a joint. It was filmed production. in Italy. Production, yep. Uh, da, 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 da. In the beginning, it was called, by the Bible, in the beginning. I, I, I don't know if it says here whether, the, I'm looking at the Wikipedia story. It doesn't say in here mm -hmm. that it's supposed to be. Is there uh, any movie that depicts the second half with, with uh, Jacob and Joseph and his brothers besides the, the musical? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was supposed to be the first in a series. Supposed to go all the way through. Three uh, sequels were never made. Um, yes, so the best Jacob and, and Joseph's uh, versions were done by TNT. Uh, well, they were, they were distributed by TNT. The Jacob ones were okay um uh the joseph one i felt was exceptional maybe one of the best one of the best um one of the best uh bible movies ever done the jacob one was an interesting one it was it was matthew modine played jacob and laura flynn boyle played rachel uh sean bean played uh asa for for fans of uh for fans of Sean Bean, you know, uh, you, you could, you could see him, um, in that movie. Uh, and, um, it was, you know, it was kind of a British, uh, American, you know, mix of people. Um, also it was, you know, it was an Italian, uh, uh you know, uh, actually this one says German, Italian and American, um, version The the Jacob one, it came out in 94, uh, TNT distributed uh, the, the I have them on video if people want I, I think I can I can hopefully dig them up on DVD I don't know if anyone has a way of watching DVD but the Joseph one was, we still have DVDs Rabbi Joseph some 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 people do I do but jo the Joseph one I have a VHS I can connect to so <laughs> follow the Joseph one is uh, the Joseph one came out 
who's not as big of a actor played Joseph in it, but I thought it was quite good. Um, came out around the same time. And, um, and uh, I'll tell you who made it. Uh, I mean, it was, it was also in TNT, but I remember that um, uh, Ben Kingsley played Potiphar in it and came out around the same time, came out in 95. They actually did it as a mini series, you know, as a few episodes, but it's available on DVD. Um, it was quite good. I think it was one of the better, better um, Potiphar's wife was played by Leslie Ann Warren, who's really good as a uh, guy named Paul Mercurio played Joseph in that. Um, he's not a huge act, you know, hugely famous actor. He's an Australian, but Martin Landau played Jacob in that. And I, I love Martin Landau. He was a, he was a great, uh, great actor. Um, Can Martin we still Landau, see him? I don't know the 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 uh, TN like I said I have the DVDs I don't know how you can watch them I, I don't it'd be great if we could somehow get rights to this on JLTV but they they had they had uh, these came out about twenty five years ago and uh, again they were done by these were all kind of it was, it was a German Italian American television uh, production and uh, this one the Joseph one was one hundred eighty five minutes so it's, it was done i think over a couple of nights but it's phenomenal i i think it was phenomenally captured joseph's life and kind of sets up the 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 exodus but it also kind of brings everything together with joseph and his and his siblings and they even still tell the story of dina in it in a really clever way and uh i just thought it was really really good um uh and ben kingsley is always good Interestingly enough, the same production company, or at least the same distribution, um, did a did a Moses with, with starring Ben Kingsley as Moses that came out uh, around the same time or not long after. So they had Ben Kingsley as Potiphar, and then he came back, re- kind of reprised uh, him. And not he didn't reprise that role. He actually played Moses, and and uh, I think he did a great job uh, capturing a Moses that's more, yeah, that was a very well done movie. The one with Ben Kingsley and Moses. Yeah, it was, it really was one of the few versions of Moses that captured him as a man who has difficulty speaking and not really sure of his role and a little bit more kind of based, I think really based on the Bible instead of, almost you, know, belie- you know, it was very believable. Yep. Yeah. I think it's one of the better uh, biblical epic so the moses i would recommend the moses and the jacob they did a um, excuse me joseph they did a jacob and they also did an abraham one in that which interestingly enough i believe the abraham one starred richard harris as abraham in that in that um in that series that that uh, tnt did and uh, not a bad not a bad one um you know it was a little a little disjointed yet yeah, came out in 93 um and it was uh, same people, five, uh, five Mile River Films. And Richard Harris, uh, Barbara Hershey played Sarah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was uh, it's pretty good. It's funny because they shot these movies, uh, these, these ones that they did in, um, in, in uh, Wazazart in uh, Morocco. And uh, it was interesting because those, those ones that they did um, they did have more of a Middle Eastern, um, a, a Middle Eastern uh, style to it. But I went to that place in Wazazart where they filmed it, and the whole city in in Morocco is just dedicated to movies. Like all they do in that place is do movies. So they do Bible movies, Middle Eastern movies. The whole city is it's there's nothing in that city except for sets and basically uh, for people to film. So they filmed. Uh, kingdom of heaven which was about the crusades and took place so almost everything is supposed to take place in israel they do that now it's really sad that israel movies about israel and ancient israel and the bible can't be filmed in israel uh, but it has mainly to do with insurance and the fact that um lots of insurance companies wouldn't wouldn't um wouldn't uh underwrite film filming in israel because of um the, the wor- worry about stoppages for an attack or something like that. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't insure films there and Morocco subsidized the movies and allowed, you know, they, they, it was a big push that they did to, to do that. And the, the labor force was much cheaper there. So Israel was, it was not actually able to compete with its, with it, with, 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 
Morocco in trying to get uh, the films done there. And quite frankly, Israel developed other industries. They didn't need to have the film industry, but um, it's kind of sad that movies about Israel can't be can't be filmed in Israel. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, take a look at the uh, uh, Genesis tonight. And I was I was hoping that that Joyce might join us. We got we got Cheryl and David there. I was with Joyce tonight. She's doing she's doing much better. Um, she appreciates all the good wishes. For those who don't know, she's she's uh, she contracted COVID about two weeks ago, a little under two weeks ago, and she's doing really well. But she's uh, you know she's doesn't have much of an appetite yet, and she's you know we're 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 still you know she's in our thoughts and prayers, and we hope that she'll return to full strength. That she's amazing, and I, as I said, I saw her. I was with her today, so uh, I can tell you that she is doing really well, and um, she is believe it or not so spunky and still has that energy and she's uh she is definitely looking forward to getting back to classes and doing things like that so uh you know we're, we're thinking about her too tonight and uh and we're going to um we're going to take a look at genesis chapter 18 and 19 today i kind of i kind of build it as as a journey to sodom and gomorrah which uh is is kind of funny because uh, of course when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, all these things come to come to um, to our memory and to our thoughts to our to 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 what we think about um, and um, and uh, we weren't we didn't have uh, we didn't have class last week but the we, we finished with chapter seventeen. And it was the story of uh, the part of the, the Torah that tells us that Avraham circumcises himself um, and his family. And uh, it says he was 99 years old when he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin and his son Ishmael. And he was 13 years old when he circumcised. And, and uh, it says all of his home, all of his household, his homeborn slaves and all those who had been brought body had been bought from outsiders were circumcised with him so it's really interesting i'm you know i'm thinking about this story you know where we're going to read this week and then sure enough i hear this um i hear this this today that i have to share with you um i heard it and i said this is too timely so it's about one minute i got to share with you this audio um it was it's uh jim gaffigan who's one of my favorite comedians there's no video to this there's only uh um there's only audio but i want you to hear one minute of him talking about the bible and uh it it was uh perfect for tonight so i'll just uh, to catch us up from where we are and talking about circumcision so uh here we go let me uh let me share jim gaffigan talking about circumcision and let me bring it up here we go it is pretty crazy obviously it started as a religious tradition circumcision but how'd they even come up with the idea Were well, there were a bunch of religious leaders gathered and one guy was like all right how should we honor god i was one i right, see we don't eat pork i don't know i like bacon <laughs> anyone got anything else what if we cut off part of our penis All right, no pork. We'll go no pork. I want that man removed. My wife told me that in the Bible, Abraham circumcised himself. Wow. I can't even get to the bank before it closes. Abraham did it. Yeah, God told him to do it. Would have loved to have overheard that conversation. Abraham, oh, hey, God, how you doing? I need you to do something for me. Oh, sure, you're God. I need you to circumcise yourself. I think we got a bad connection. Uh, can you send me an email? Are you on Facebook yet? I tell you, those challenges in the Bible took a leap in difficulty there. You know, it's like, don't eat this apple, build me a boat, cut off part of your penis. <laughs> what if I build you two boats? How did Abraham even tell his wife, you know? Maybe he didn't, he was just getting out of the shower. She was like, what the hell have you done? <laughs> Honey, I can explain. God told me to do it. 
if God told you to jump off a bridge, if God told you to sacrifice our first, actually, I have to talk to you about that one. So, uh, yeah, Th that was a perfect segue to what we're going to talk about tonight, which is exactly that. The, um, the fact that um, Abraham is going to be told <laughs> so it's a, it's a, a little biblical a uh, little biblical humor which i felt was was right on target when i heard it i was like oh my gosh this is perfect for this week's torah portion which is um which is again about abraham uh the follow up to his circumcision and interestingly chapter 18 which is read as a separate torah portion now we're we're actually beginning another torah portion believe it or not this is only the fourth portion in the book of genesis so if we're reading this week by week we're actually uh we've only we've 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 only read four portions. I mean, this is the beginning of the fourth portion. So, so if you're reading it in, in we, we're in the fourth week, which again, you think about how much we've re read and how we've read it in depth, you would have missed so much. And and so today we're not even going to finish Vaira. We're going to read a couple chapters of it, but it begins. Uh, and and again, we read this at High Holidays. We read this at Rosh Hashanah. We read part of it, not this part. We read the next part of it where we next week and, and let's take a look at um what happens and why i reminded you about circumcision is because this portion begins the lord appeared to him by the terebinths which again is kind of a fancy word to say uh oak grove the oak grove of mamra and he was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the day grew hot looking up he saw three men standing near him as soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them and bowing to the ground. He said, my lords, if it please you, do not go past your servant. Let a little water be brought out. Bathe your feet and recline under the tree. And let me fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. Then go on, seeing that you have come your servant's way. And they replied, do as you have said. Now. Why now? Why did these visitors come? Now, we know that it's the Lord, but what he sees is three men. And he, he says to them, my lords, plural, um, he asks them to, to come to them. And it's not clear yet whether he knows at this point that they're angels or God or this manifestation, as we're going to see here, the discussion that he has with them implies that God, or when God speaks through angels, that at least here in Genesis, that there really is no difference between God and the angels. They're not independent beings or more manifestations of God in this world. Um, but take a look here, what he says, because he says, let me get you some food. Let me bathe your feet. This is a very kind of human necessities. If these are angels, they really don't need this kind of thing. But again, he says, let's bathe your feet, climb under the tree. This is Avraham's hospitality. So we look at this as kind of the, as the chapter begins, the ultimate acts of hospitality. What does a person do when someone comes to their tents? And Abraham is the exemplar of of hospitality. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why we say that he was chosen to be the first uh, Jew was because he was generous and 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 kind to people, to to anybody who came near. So that's what he does. He does um, he does this act of hospitality. But what's interesting is the rabbis point out that as much as Abraham is doing an act of hospitality as a mitzvah, what we call hachnasad or achim, which is bringing in guests, that God and the angels are actually performing a mitzvah too. And the rabbis connected to what had just happened, which is Abraham had just been circumcised. 
And so the rabbis de de deduce that when this happens, which is immediately according to them, it doesn't say how long after. So we appear, it appears that God is, you know, right responding right afterwards, that God is actually doing another mitzvah, the act of Bikur Cholim, called visiting the sick. And so that this is a call, a hospital call, if you will, that God makes to Abraham to check on him and to see how he's doing in his recovery. So interestingly, this is the this is the setup for um, for um, for why God is here at this moment. Any questions or comments so far? All right. So, where did this idea of uh, washing your feet come with hospitality? So, interestingly, in the desert, in desert peoples, that washing your feet would be considered to be like one of the first things you do when you came into someone's tent. And partly because, again, you're in the desert and you're wearing sandals and, um, you know, this is kind of a way to, to kind of clean yourself off before you come into someone's tent. But, uh, yeah, it's considered to be, uh, you know, a basic if you will, a basic kind of, of caring for people. And of course it became, um, it became synonymous with, uh, um, one of the acts that that's done in other religions specifically, you know, again, Islam has a, a tradition of, of washing, uh, feet before you pray, but in, 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 uh, in Christianity, it's a symbol of, of, of service and of, of, um, of, um, of humility because it's something that actually is done in the Christian Bible when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So this becomes an example of, you know, being like God by, uh, you know, by uh, showing that even God does these kinds of things, at least in the Christian Bible. So one of the things that the Pope will do is uh, wash someone's feet. It's, it's kind of a, um, a reenactment of Jesus, if you will. And so the Pope will, will do that, um, you know, as, uh, you know, certain, certain rituals, certain times when this is done. One of them is, um, is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, Thursday before Easter called Maundy Thursday. And it, and it is, uh, Maundy is the, is the, uh, tradition of, of, of feet washing. Uh, in John, it says, if I, then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he sent greater than he who sent him. I know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So um, that's not in the other gospels, but it is a powerful, uh, you know, kind of teaching of humility. And so that, Christians do it. I knew that Christianity had it in its tradition. I just didn't know that Islam had it in it too. Yeah. And so uh, in, in Islam, it's done before people go to a pray they wash their hands and their feet uh traditionally it's not i mean not everybody does that but it is a tradition and there's washing stations for people to do that at mosque so that people can reenact that so it you know it, again it's part of um it's part of jewish tradition here and you see it and then um and then um of course, and again, in Middle Eastern traditions, it became kind of a, it was also part of religion, you know, religion. So the angels or the God and the angels say, and again, it's not really clear, is God one of the three angels? Or are they all speaking with out of God's voice? It's not very clear. I will tell you that. Um, Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three sayas of choice flour, knead and make cakes. And Abraham went 
ran to the herd, took a calf tender and choice, and gave it to a servant boy who hastened to prepare it. He took curds and milk and a calf that had been prepared and set it before them, and he waited them under the tree as they ate. So many things to talk about in that sentence. <laughs> Where to begin? Where to begin? Well, let's talk about one of them, which is that the rabbis definitely felt uncomfortable with the seemingly unkosher nature of this meal. <laughs> that there seems to be a mixture of milk and meat. Uh, so they don't like that. They don't like the fact that this happens and they have to explain it. They can't simply say that Abraham didn't know the laws of Kashrut. That's maybe the easiest answer, but they don't like that answer. They don't like the idea that Abraham didn't live by the laws. They, they want Abraham to live by those. So they're not going to go down that, that, that road. So they say that perhaps the word milk, curds and milk, is not shouldn't be translated as milk. Chema means uh, butter or curds, and chalav usually means milk. So the whole of chalav in, in, in Hebrew and, and in Yiddish, it's, it's dairy, it's milk. But it is possible that chema and chalav actually refers to some type of fat, type of lard, if you will, meat lard that they use schmaltz, if you will. It's possible, it's not likely, because it seems as though the chalav is some kind of curd, like a yogurt. There's another possibility the rabbis offer, which is that there is an appetizer, and after a certain amount of time, then they eat the meat. So they, they wait, they have dairy, they wait, and then they eat. That's a possibility. Those are all ways around the milk and meat issue. I think that there might maybe be a bigger issue, which is they're angels. Why are they eating at all? Don't they, don't they not need to have food? So it's not really clear why they even eat. And it says that he waited on them under the tree as they ate. So it doesn't say they eat. They like made the food vanish. Maybe they did. The rabbis kind of say that, that they only appeared that they ate. They didn't really eat. But it doesn't say that. And so it kind of gets to this other issue, which is what do angels eat? Are angels eating food? Do they pretend to eat food? Do they sometimes eat food? Do they eat food when they're in human form? I don't know. But it does say that they ate. So if they didn't eat, they were pretending to eat, and then they made it disappear, but it seems as though they ate. So that happens. That's the first verses, the first set of verses. Then we get into this story that a lot of people know, though we kind of already had this story, so this might be like the second version of this story. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he replied, there in the tent. Then one said, I will return to you next year, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and Sarah had stopped having the periods of women. Which we've already said in another form earlier on when she took Hagar. She was barren. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, Now that I am withered, Am I to have enjoyment with my husband so old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I in truth bear a child as old as I am? We're going to pause right there. I mean, let's not go further than that right now. So in this, Sarah actually, it's not just, Abraham that's told that they're going to have a baby. Sarah's told that they're going to have a baby. Or at least Sarah hears it. So she's there. She hears it. And assumedly, Abraham doesn't know that she heard it and that she laughed. Because God now says, why did Sarah laugh? So, so what happens in this scene is that 
they don't see each other they're not they're not with each other in this scene like right in front of each other but they're close enough that they can at least you know when the angel or when god is talking they can they can hear it they can hear the same stuff but abraham didn't hear sarah laughing or at least didn't hear what she said because it does say she said it to herself so she could have laughed out loud and then said you know kind of chuckled and then said to herself so she said it to herself uh, i might have enjoyment with my husband so old so sarah doesn't believe it that's clear now it's god saying to abraham so at this point does does abraham now realize that this is god or at least angels um i mean the angels have now told him again or god's told him that he's having a baby so that's not something that strangers normally tell you so we don't know what at what point abraham knows that this is god and and, and, or, and divine visitation we don't know but as readers we know that the lord said to abraham why did sarah laugh now some of you have heard me point this out before but it's a another point that we need to make because we talked about already the mitzvah of hospitality talked about the mitzvah of visiting the sick here's another mitzvah that just happened and this is a mitzvah that god actually performs and it's a weird mitzvah because it's a mitzvah that actually required a little bit of a reformulation of what was said right because sarah didn't say shall i in truth bear a child as old as i am i mean she said that but she also said with my husband so old but notice that God didn't say that to Abraham. God left that part out. So it's not exactly a lie, but it wasn't the whole truth. So, so Abraham didn't hear it. He wouldn't have heard it. Maybe, again, this is all said internally, and Sarah he says it to herself, and God hears it. But no matter what, God doesn't tell Abraham. And the rabbis like to point out that this is a mitzvah, what God actually does. It's a really important mitzvah, that God performs an act of thoughtfulness here, which we call Shalom Bayit, which is creating peace in the house. God intentionally doesn't say to Abraham, your wife just said you're, you're an old guy. You can't have sex anymore. Hmm. Left that part out. And so what God did is protected Abraham's self-esteem. He made peace in the house because he didn't say Hey, you know, your wife is telling everybody that you can't have sex anymore. Didn't say that. And so God performs this act of shalom bayit, of creating peace in the house. So sometimes we do it by helping people um, get along in the house, a husband and wife, uh, parents, parents and children. All those things are considered a mitzvah to help create peace in the house, shalom bayit. But sometimes we do it by simply not aggravating a situation and not giving people, not telling them necessarily the things that will make them not like each other. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean lying. It sometimes means not telling everything that had happened. Now, there's definitely limits to that. And one could say, you know, if something's really bad, you shouldn't hold back the truth. But in some cases, there is no need to make a situation worse and people can consciously not aggravate the situation. The, the issue is, is sometimes people do, of course, the exact opposite. They purposely focus on the negative and try to create discord in a house. They try, they try to hurt the peace of, of a person's home and um, that clearly is not the, the role model that, that God provides for us here, which is that even some times God doesn't have to tell the whole, the whole story to protect people's feelings. And I think that that's an interesting little teaching here from this, which is that here we have an example of God not saying, hey, your wife thinks you're old. So it's a nice little teaching about creating peace, making people not feel bad for 
if we don't have to, if we can get away, if we can get the point across, because what did she get the point? Her point was essentially, his point was, you know, you're going to have a baby and don't, you know, don't disbelieve this miracle that's going to happen. But God didn't say it in a way that would also humiliate Abraham. No, he's holding Sarah accountable. He's still, he's still saying Sarah shouldn't have laughed, essentially, as you'll see, but doesn't make Abraham feel bad at the same time. Because here's God's response. Is anything too wondrous for the Lord? I will return to you at the same season next year, and Sarah will have a son. So if Abraham at this time doesn't know that this is God or an angel, they're definitely speaking on behalf of, of them. And when it says, I will return to you at the same season next year, it seems pretty clear that this is a miraculous visitation. And here we have a very interesting kind of end to that scene, which is that Sarah lied saying, I did not laugh for she was frightened, but he replied, you did laugh. So I always felt that this story is uh, kind of a, one of these interesting dialogues that we have in the Bible where it's there for a reason. And those verses are, are, are very rarely depicted, but they're important because they actually show a little bit about human behavior, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And quite frankly, because we're human, we do things like this. And it says specifically that Sarah lied. She, she lied and said she didn't laugh. She's, she's talking to God, or maybe she, she didn't care at that point because she didn't want to be held accountable for her lack of faith, if you will. Now, of course, all of this is a play on Isaac because the word that appears two times here in this verse which was also up here in this verse, Vatitzachak and Lo Tzachakti, and that is Ki Tzachakti. I laughed. The word laugh appears a few times here. And of course, that same root, Tzachak, is the root for Isaac, for Yitzchak. His name means laugh or playfulness, which of course is ironic because life isn't very funny, but yet they laugh at his birth. And this is part of Isaac's birth story, if you will, and his identity, which is laughter. But it's laughter, if you look at it, at the same time that there's fear. It's nervous laughter. It's fearful laughter now, too, because at first it might have been, <laughs> yeah, right, I'm going to have a baby scornful or mocking laughter but now it's almost like you're afraid you know now you're afraid and so this is um this is what's conveyed in this in these in these verses which are really very human it's a very human scene and it ends with the men set out from there and looked down towards sodom and abraham walking with them to see them off so they're looking out towards Sodom, and Abraham walks with them. And now, whatever happened with the men, which again, as we're going to see, are clearly angels, because they're, it says they're angels in the, in the next chapter, the, God is talking to Abraham. So if there's three people or three individuals, one of them now seems to have been God, and the other two seem to be these other two divine entities. So it's, it's not really revealed at what points they exactly, we know that they know that these are divine, this is divine, these are of divine visitation, Abraham and Sarah, but it's interesting that God appears to them like this, because again, God's already spoken to Abraham. It's not like God hasn't spoken to Abraham already, um, but it, it is, it is a scene where Abraham is, is seeing God being visited by God in this world. It's not just a dream. This is all happening in front of him, including the food, including washing the feet. I mean, this is a human divine interaction that literally is tangible. And here's the scene of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, introduced, if you will, how it's introduced. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? 
since Abraham is to become a great and populous nation, and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right, in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised. So this is kind of like an internal an, an internal conversation, an, an internal, eternal conversation of God, which basically is God saying, I got to tell Abraham, is God speaking to the angels? Is God having this internally, you know, just this thought? I have to tell Abraham because Abraham is going to be a great nation, as we've already heard, heard it back from chapter 12. You're going to bless, everyone's going to be blessed by them. And, and he's going to be the one who's going to be teaching his children and teaching the next generations how to do what's just and right, how to do sudakao mishpat, how to be good and just, and how to do what's right. I need to tell him what I'm about to do so that he can learn and that he can then instruct the next generations. This is where Abraham begins to, again, be that guy. It's different from Noah. It's different than, than Adam. And again, whatever, you know, Jim Gaffigan and his humor points out where Noah built a boat, Abraham and his descendants are going to have to do more. And they're going to have to do more because they are, their job is to do what's just and right. And that they are going to have to have a lot harder work than the guy who's building a boat. Got to keep the world together. And here's what God says. The Lord said, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grave. I will go down to see whether they have acted altogether according to the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will take note. And the men went on from there to Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So that scene as it plays out, Avraham says to him, the outrage of Sodom and is so great. And again, it says, you know, it, the, you know, the way the Bible recounts it is that God says, I need to see if what I'm hearing is as bad as, with my, you know, with my angel, my angel eyes here are going to come down here and see whether this is really happening. And so it's interesting that God seems to kind of need to have more information God actually needs to send in some, some spies, if you will. He needs to be, get some information on the ground. He can't just rely on the, on the in, intel that he has. You got to send in some, some people on the ground. So God's going to do this right now. In the next chapter, we're going to see that scene as it plays out. But it's interesting because, again, the rabbis like to point out something got to God. Some information was getting to God. And there are, are midrashim that... There were things that happened at Sodom and Gomorrah before, before this next scene that makes God aware that things have gone off the rails in Sodom and Gomorrah. So this wasn't the, you know, this isn't like he's going there without uh, having some, some reasons in the first place. We've already been introduced to Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that Lot is living there already. We know that Lot got captured with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that Abraham came to their rescue. So Abraham's already had a re re relationship with these people. He's already saved them, if you will. So we've already had a little pretaste of, of this. Um, um, let's see what Abraham does as he's been, been he's been told what's going to happen. And here's the first time. In the entire Bible, that somebody questions God. Abraham came forward and said, Will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? What if there should be 50 innocent within the city? Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of 50 innocent who are in it? So, this is Abraham challenging God. So, when we talk about what makes Abraham special, when we want to figure out why is he chosen? Well, some people say it's because of his hospitality, because of his ability to reach out to other people and be open to other people. There's another possibility here, which is that this is what makes him the 
man. And that is his commitment to justice, even challenging God. And he doesn't accuse God of doing anything bad, but he says, God, will you do this? I mean, it, does, it seems to me like we got it. We got to protect the innocent. Right? That's, that's our job. And so God hears something special from Abraham here, right? He hears a, a willingness to, to question God. Whereas nowhere, when Noah is told the entire world is going to be destroyed, does Noah step up and do this? This is the difference. This is the difference. Is that this is a more evolved person who now says, but maybe there's 50 good people in this town. Noah, I'm going to destroy the whole world. The whole world. Noah doesn't say, maybe there's 50 good people. I mean, it's the whole world. It's got to be more than 50 good people, right? God, it's the whole world. Doesn't say anything. But these two cities, Abraham says, maybe, maybe, maybe there's good people there. And so here's God's reaction. Oh, yeah, I didn't finish. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty. So the innocent and the guilty are all alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And that's actually a really important part because he calls God the judge of all the earth. He uses that phrase for God. And he says, as a just God, and again, doing mishpat, doing, doing, um, you know, doing justly, maybe again, we have to make sure that the innocent, the tzaddik, the righteous person, person who does right should not be lumped in with the guilty right it can't be you can't there's that's not justice so god's response the lord answered if i find within the city of sodom 50 innocent ones i will for, forgive the whole place for their sake abraham spoke up saying here i venture to speak to my lord I, who am but dust and ashes, what if the 50 innocent should lack five? Will you destroy the whole city for want of the five? And he answered, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And so Abraham begins now the negotiation, right? What if God, can I get, can I get you for 45? Can you, can I talk you down God to 45? What if, I, what if we can do this deal for 45? And again, he says it in a very humble, humble way. You know, God, who am I to speak? I'm a human being. But can't you, can't you spare it for 45? And God says, I'll do it for 45. I'm not going to do it. And he spoke up to him again. What if 40 should be found there? And he answered, I won't do it for the sake of 40. And he said, let not my Lord be angry if I go on. But what if 30 should be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And again, this is the negotiation going back and forth. 45, now 40, now 30. And Abraham says, and he said, I venture again to speak to my Lord. What if 20 should be found there? And he answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Same thing. I won't do it for the sake. I will not. I will not do it. And each time the words change a little bit. Each time God's response is, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And then also, I will not destroy for the sake of 20. So the, the phrase changes each time when God says it. Um, and uh, and then the last time, here we go, is he says, and he said, let not my Lord be angry if I speak this, but this last time. What if 10 should be found there? And he answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. And this last time, it's the exact same phrase. Lo Actually, yeah, I mean, 20 and then ha for the 10. I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. And so God says, I won't even destroy it if there's 10 righteous people there. Okay? And that's it. And when the Lord had finished speaking to Abraham, he departed and Abraham returned to his place. And so that discussion 
ends chapter 18. So if we just ended there and Sodom and Gomorrah had been spared, they are, they're spared because of Abraham. They're spared because Abraham says to God, maybe there's 10 righteous people in this whole city. Now, do we know how many people are in Sodom and Gomorrah? I would have said last year, we're not really sure. And to say how many people there are, it's probably somewhat mythological. Is it real? Can we, can we, uh, can we know for sure? second i'm about to show you the story uh, it'd be tough to say but um we doubt we now can kind of say that there are thousands of people that potentially lived in these places tens of thousands of people because we actually have now discovered some of these cities that we believe were what were the basis for the Sodom and Gomorrah story. So 10 people is not a lot of people percentage wise of these cities. These are not villages or, you know, little a tent city. These are cities that are large enough to, to support um, several thousand people. So now we get to, to Sodom and Gomorrah and here we're, this is what we're going to read today, and we're going to read chapter 19 now today. As I said before, if you have any way of being with us next Tuesday morning when we read the story from Judges, to be able to read these two stories together, I did not plan it this way. I promise you, I did not plan it. I was hoping that they'd line up, but I had no idea that they would. Um, they are lining up, and so you get to read the two stories back to back today. And then Tuesday. So if you can join us Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. our time, Pacific, you'll be able to see the other version of this story. It is amazing. And a lot of people don't know that there are two versions of a, of a Sodom and Gomorrah story in the Bible. And interestingly enough, they're both chapter 19. We did not put in chapters. As I said, the Christians put in the chapters and verses. Um, Judges chapter 19 and Genesis chapter 19 are eerily similar. So here's the Genesis chapter 19 story. Again, one of the more famous stories, but you're going to read it in the original. You're going to, well, at least in the original translation, um, but we'll look at the Hebrew a little bit. So the two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he arose to greet them and bowing low with his face to the ground. So far, very similar to in some ways, to what Abraham does. He bows low to the ground. He's not in his tent, so he can't bring them in, and he's not even in his house. But he does rise to greet them. Act of hospitality. And he says to them, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house to spend the night and bathe your feet. There you go. And then you may be on your way. Early. But they said, No, we'll spend the night in the square. Now, does Lot know that they're angels? Does Lot know that they can handle themselves anywhere? Doesn't seem so, not at least at first. But their answer is, no, we'll stay outside. We're not going into your house. Uh, but he urged them strongly. So they turned away, turned his way and uh, entered his house. He prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Now, he doesn't quite put out the spread that Avraham and Sarah do. By the way, it says that he prepared it for them and baked their uh, uh, matzot. That's the word, matzot. That's why it's unleavened bread. Not quite the spread. It's not the, um, the bread that, he, uh, that uh, Sarah made for him, and it's not the goat and the curds and all that stuff, but you know, he makes it says it's a feast. So there's other stuff besides the unleavened bread, but you know, baking bread is a, an important thing. The rabbis like to point out, where's his wife? We know she's there. We know she's there. But it doesn't say she helped. It says he prepared the feast for them and break, baked the unleavened bread. So it seems as though his wife is not quite as 
hospitable. She's a native Sodomite, and she's been living like the Sodomites, her townspeople. She doesn't have the same values that Lot does. Lot's from the family of Terah. He's a he's a he's part of Abraham's family. He's learned what to do when when somebody comes to your house, comes to your town, you take care of them. Not so his wife, and that's why it doesn't say she did it. Hold on to that thought when we read about more about Lot's wife, but she doesn't prepare the feast. He does. Uh, there's even a midrash, by the way, that goes so far as saying that she wouldn't even let the guests stay in, in her house. He actually, they actually had a fight. And like she drew a line through the house and said, he's, they're not coming in our side of the house. They have to be in their side. It's like that I love Lucy episode where they, you know, divide the house between the apartment and Lucy has one side and Ricky has the other. So the the angels only get to be on lot side of the house which you know you know which side was the bathroom on you know bathroom in the house necessarily but you know where 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 does where do the where's the table you know where's the they had to split the house she wouldn't have them she's so inhospitable and here's the good part <sighs> They had not laid down when the townspeople, the men of Sodom, young and old, and all the people to the last man gathered about the house. And they shouted to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may be intimate with them. Now, the translation of the word yada, and in this, in this case, the plural, neda which is, I, you know, let us be intimate with them, let us know them. They didn't even put a asterisk by that and say it says no, it says intimate. Okay, it's possible. I will tell you this, that when you look at the actual phrase, the Anshes Dome, it says that all of them were there from the young man to the old man. Kol Ha'am down to the last man gathered about the house. Now, the word on Sheha here and on Shea stone, the men of the town, the men of stone, here they translated on Sheha here as the townspeople. You see where I'm going with this, right? Anybody? It maybe wasn't just men. It could have been all the people. The word on Shea doesn't have to be doesn't have to be only men it's the plural for people which is why it says the townspeople it doesn't say that men of the town mainly because again it, it we know that that phrase is often used to convey men and women now again it the plural could be men but it also could be men and women so what would lead us to believe that it's everybody is it says kol ha'am. It doesn't say all of the men. It says kol, it says everybody. So they translated it as down to the last man, but, but it really means all of them. Now, why is this so important? Because the sin of Sodom becomes... a it becomes essentially homosexuality. Sodomy becomes a word in English that's not about rape or sex other than man having sex with another man. It's, it's homosexuality. It's not just rape or sex. It's specifically homosexuality. So the way that this story is oftentimes read is that this is a story that talks about how evil the sin of homosexuality is here when when you keep in mind that it doesn't really seem to be about that it's about again the way people treat guests to their city and it also is about the way that people are um essentially willing to um, um 
rape people, which is a whole nother level of being inhospitable. Um, but this is, this is pretty tough. This is pretty tough stuff. There's no question. So they shouted a lot, bring these people out, bring those men. We, we want to be intimate with them. We want to, we want to know them. We want to, we want to be intimate. I have no issue with that translation, but uh, it, it's to know them. And it says, so Lot went out to them to the entrance and shut the door behind him and said, I beg you, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. That right there, there's an act of amazing sacrifice and um, heroism and uh, pretty brave because he closes the door behind him and he's putting himself out there. He's, he's going to be victimized. If anyone's going to be victimized, it's going to be Lot. Everybody sees that. It's this next part that gets to be a little problematic. Look, I have two daughters who've not known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you please. Do not do anything to these men, since they have come under the shelter of my roof. And this is where the story gets to be a little problematic for Lot, at least. Because Lot's solution here is take my daughters. Not only you didn't take my daughters, they're virgins. But just don't do this to the people who've come under my roof. I'm responsible for them. And this would be um, this is unacceptable. So, of course, the question is, how can it be acceptable that you're willing to have your daughters be raped? Now, there is a possibility that Lot is saying this because he is grasping for straws and he's essentially saying something to them that he knows that they're, they, he knows that they're not going to take him up on this from the standpoint of he doesn't think that they're actually going to say, oh, okay, we'll take the daughters. So it, it is possible that he's just throwing it out there because he just wants them to go away and, and he doesn't think that they really will take him up on it. On the other hand, does he feel that that's a better solution than having his guests be raped? Look, Part of the issue is if he's, and one of the reasons why the homosexual, the homosexual issue became kind of the, the teaching from this in, in some traditions, not in Judaism, but in some traditions, is because the alternative to having the men have the women and they don't want to have the women. But it's pretty clear from their response that that's not the issue. They said, stand back. The fellow, they said, came here as an alien, as an outsider, and he already acts as the ruler. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. And they pressed hard against the person of Lot and moved forward to break the door. So the townspeople are now upset at Lot for trying to tell them what to do. Which again seems to be this issue that they were... This is what they did. This isn't the first time. This isn't their first rodeo, as they say, that this is what they do. And now this guy comes to us and tries to tell us how to behave. He's not one of us. He's an immigrant. He's an outsider. And now he's telling us. Now, remember, it's because of Lot that they even got rescued in the first place. Lot, Lot's 
uncle Abraham came to their rescue and saved them. And now they've turned on Lot. It wasn't for Lot. Who knows how many of these people would even be alive. And yet, this is what they're willing to do. So we can see that Sodom and Gomorrah, the people are terrible. And it's not just one thing. And it's definitely not just the fact that they're trying to rape these people. Because it seems like now they're willing to do whatever they want to Lot. And what are they going to do? Because they said, we're going to deal worse with you than with them. So whatever they were going to do to them is nothing compared to what they're now saying they're going to do to Lot. And they're upset because Lot tried to do the right thing. So here's what happens. The men stretched out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And the people who were at the entrance of the house, young and old, they struck them with blinding light. So they were helpless to find the entrance. Wow. So that's the first part of the miracle. They are blinded. Can't see. Because they can't see, they can't get into the door. Now here, interestingly, they translated it as people, young and old. Here it says from the, it's a little different phrase. It's katon uh, ad hagadol, from the little, from the little to the big. But I mean, it basically is saying that as men and women and children, or at least young and old, were all out there at this for this. They're struck with a blinding light and they couldn't find the entrance. And again, it's also, the rabbis like to point out that these angels stretched out their hands and pulled Lot in the house. Now, rabbis like to interpret this as that this is not also something you should like put aside and just say, oh, they, they reached out and grabbed him. No, their arms stretched out. And so their arms like Mr. Stretch, Dr. Stretch, pull Lot into the house. So their hands stretch out magically, miraculously, and pull him in. So this is, you know, before they even get struck by blindness, this is the first act of power, supernatural power that we have, is that they pull him in and then make everybody blind. Okay. The men said to Lot, whom else do you have here? Sons-in-laws, your sons and daughters, or anyone else that you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place. Because the outcry against them before the Lord has become so great, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So right now, Lot knows for sure what's going to happen here. At this point, look, his life has been threatened. His family has been threatened. I mean, Lot knows now this isn't a place to be if he didn't know before he knows now now if this had been going on and he didn't say anything about it or do anything about it that means a lot is essentially culpable too because he didn't do what he should have done to protect his family and to protect himself from becoming like the people of sodom he didn't do it but now the angels are here to save them and the angels say you know who else is here let's we're going to get out of the city so What's interesting here is God says, I'll save the city if there's 10 people there. God's not letting anyone innocent be destroyed because God is now taking Lot and getting them out of there and Lot's family. And the assumption is, is that they're okay. But are they okay? Are, is his family okay? Now, here's the weird thing. Well, there's a lot of weird things, but here's one of the weird things. Lot had said before that he had two daughters that had not known a man. Was that true or was it not true or what happened? We don't know. But it seems as though maybe he had a, some other people with him. Because it seems as though he has some son-in-laws, which means maybe he had more than two daughters. He had a couple other daughters who were married. Maybe to people of Sodom. So he has two daughters we know that are not married or at least two daughters that are going to leave with him. But keep in mind that maybe his family was already a little bit more 
expansive than just having two daughters and a wife. Okay. Lot spoke out, went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who had married his daughters and said, up, oh, get out of this place for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his son-in-laws as one who jests. So it says right there that he had son-in-laws and assumedly married two daughters who were not the two daughters that he was going to throw out, who were virgins still. Again, the story is much more complex than you probably remembered or ever thought about. Because as dawn broke, the angels urged Lot on, saying, up, take your wife and your two remaining daughters. Lest you be swept away because of the iniquity of the city. So it seems as though that not all of Lot's family left. But he has part of his family that is left behind in Sodom and Gomorrah. So this complicates the story a little bit because it also gives us another layer of what does Lot leave behind in Sodom? What did Lot's wife leave behind in Sodom? So he doesn't leave right away. The angels told him to get out. And his son-in-laws don't believe him. And finally, as dawn breaks, the angels get him out. So it seems as a lot is not getting out of town right away. He wants to get his family out. Now, that lit is a layer of the story that, again, if we think about it, he, he's been told the city is going to be destroyed. His family won't leave. He's trying to get his family to come with them. They won't leave. It won't go. So there's a power to this story because you, you know it's been repeated when people know that, you know, where you're living is going to hell and people don't leave. They don't take, they don't get the hint. They um, want to stay behind, even when they know that they're risking their lives or that their lives are, are going to not be worth anything if they stay behind. Yet people do it. Still he delayed. So the men seized his hand. Again, same scene. Of, again, being pulled. The men seized his hand in the hands of his wife and his two daughters in the Lord's mercy on him and brought him out and left him outside the city. So when you really read this story, you're left with this understanding that Lot, even with the, as this is happening, wouldn't leave. Like if it was up to Lot, he would have died. He would have burned with the rest of Sodom. It's the angels who, who get him out. And that's a part of the story that we don't think about. You know, we kind of like think, oh, Lot got out of town. He's told he's going to leave. He's got to go. And he goes. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he wouldn't leave. On the contrary, he wanted to stay behind or couldn't leave. He wanted to. He, he, he felt compelled to. When they brought them outside, one said, flee for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, lest you be swept away. But Lot said to them, oh, no, my Lord. You have been so gracious to your servant and have already shown me so much kindness in order to save my life, but I cannot flee to the hills lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Look at that town. There's near enough to flee to. It's such a little place. Let me flee there. It is such a little place. Let my life be saved. And he replied, very well, I will grant you this favor too. I will not annihilate a town which you've spoken 
hurry, flee to there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Hence the town came to be called Soar. And again, the, the reason that this place is called Soar is because according to this little tiny story, is it's a story in the region that got saved because it was a little place. Meets Arhi, that it's a little place. And so the name of this town, Soar, little town, if you will, is called Littleton because Lot named it that and said, I want to go to this little town so that I don't have to run up into the hills. I'll stay in this town. And the angels essentially say, Okay, we'll save that town. We'll spare that area for you. And that's how Soar is called, even to, to this day. Hence, the town came to be called Soar. So it's a it's an ideology of the town. And it says, and the sun rose upon the earth, and Lot entered Soar. And the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire from the Lord out of heaven. That's the fire and brimstone, but it's 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 the same word we had for for um, the gopher, the the kind of the pitch that was used um, it is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah he annihilated those cities and the entire plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and the vegetation of the ground and Lot's wife looked back and she thereupon turned into the pillar of salt and that is maybe the most memorable part of this is what happens to Lot's wife. So again, you know, the Midrash tells us that it's because she's, she can't leave. She's, she's Sodom. She's from Sodom. It's in her blood. It's who she is. And she can't, she can't move on. Again, when you read the story in its entirety and realize that she had some family left behind, maybe there's a little bit more compassion for her and that how could she move on? Her family's still there. She, she can't leave it behind. The rabbis also like to point out that because she wouldn't set up, she wouldn't take part in the food. She wouldn't get the food ready. She got turned into salt, which is one of the backbones of any good Jewish meal. It's gotta be a little salt in there. Too much salt, probably. She gets turned into salt because she didn't want to help out cooking. So there's an even deeper level to the Midrash that that's why she's salted. Assaulted, if you will. That's a bad one. That is a, that is a tribute to Lee. To say assaulted. Uh, so Lot's wife is the pillar of salt. And again, you know, the, the, the thing we talk about is the fact that the uh, pillars of uh, salt, the, 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 the deposits, mineral deposits that are, are around the Dead Sea are uh, oftentimes look like people. And so people will point out, well, that pillar looks like Lot's wife, you know, that this is, looks like a person. So that's what um, we're left with, too, is an explanation for these things. Um, we're going to read a little bit more and then I'm going to share with you something. The next morning, Abraham hurried to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And looking toward Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the land of the plain, he saw smoke of the land rising like the smoke of a kiln. And that phrase of the smoke rising, the way the Hebrew gives us this, smoke rising from the kiln, this cloud of smoke, you know, makes us think about Hiroshima or the ovens in the camps. What's the word for smoke? It's a kitor. So it's kitor. And it uses the word twice. The hineola kitor. The, here's the smoke rising. Like kitor kivoshin. It's like a kiln like an oven it's like the smoke that comes out of an oven 
And that's what was left was smoke. So um, it's really kind of eerie that that would be here. And then what we went through in uh, the Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah. And this fire is, uh, it's brutal because it, it just obliterates everything. And it says it obliterates everything. It obliterates even the vegetation. And, and it says that was, it was then that the Lord destroyed the cities of the plain and annihilated the cities where Lot dwelt. God was mindful of Abraham and removed Lot from the midst of the upheaval. And let's take a, a little, I'm going to share with you a little thing here, which, as I said, is from today's news. And I'll share with you now an article from smithsonian so this is the article that was just in the uh, smithsonian magazine uh, it's from september it's kind of a picture of what it looked like when tell el hamam was wiped out by a blast 1000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb used at hiroshima as temperatures rapidly rose above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, Christopher Moore wrote, clothing and wood immediately burst into flames. Swords, spears, mud bricks, and pottery began to melt. Almost immediately, the entire city was on fire. And here's what it says. For those of you who didn't hear about this, the destruction of Tal, Tal al-Hamam, the Bronze Age city in the Jordan Valley, by an exploding comet or meteor may have inspired the stories Sodom and Gomorrah, a new study suggests. A notoriously sinful city, Sodom and Gomorrah's devastation by sulfur and fire is recorded in the book of Genesis. At the time of the disaster around 1650, which places it right around the time of Abraham. I mean, basically, this is when Abraham would have lived from about 2000, 1800 to about 1500. This is about the time when Abraham would have lived was the largest of three major cities in the valley. It is likely acted as the region's political center, reports Ariella Marsden of the Jerusalem Post. Combined, the three metropolises boasted a population of about 50,000. And that's based on the homes and, the, and the, archeo the archeological evidence of what they found. But here's what they found now. This is what's new because we found cities or the remnants of cities in the area around the Dead Sea before. We found graves for these people. We know that there was a population, a, a decent sized population. What we didn't know is how they got destroyed. And here's what happened. Tell all moms, mud bricks stood up to five stories tall. That's tall in the ancient world. Over the years, archaeologists examining the structures, ruins have found evidence of a sudden high temperature destructive event. For instance, pottery pieces that were melted on the outside but untouched in the on the inside the new paper published in the journal of uh, nature scientific reports examined possible causes for the devastation based on the archaeological record the researchers concluded that warfare a fire or a volcanic eruption or an earthquake were unlikely culprits as these events couldn't have produced the intense the heat intense enough to cause the melting recorded at the scene that left a space rock is the most likely cause. Because experts failed to find a crater at the site, they attributed the damage to an airburst created when a meteor or comet traveled through the atmosphere at high speed. It would have exploded about two and a half miles above the city in a blast 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb used at Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Okay. At temperature, as temperature, air temperatures rapidly rose above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Clothing and wood immediately burst into flames. Swords, spears, and mud ricks began to melt, no, as I said. Seconds after the blast, a shockwave ripped through the city at a speed of roughly 740 miles per hour, faster than the worst tornado ever recorded. The city's buildings were reduced to foundations and rubble. None of the 8,000 people or any animals within the city survived, Moore said. Their bodies were torn apart and their bones were blasted into small fragments. Corroborating the idea that an airburst caused the destruction, 
the researchers found melted metals and unusual mineral fragments among the city's ruins. One of the main discoveries is shock quartz, says James Kennedy, emeritus earth scientist at UC Santa Barbara. In a statement, these are sand grains containing cracks that form only under very high pressure. The archaeologists also discovered high concentrations of salt in the destruction layer of the site, possibly from the blast impact on the Dead Sea or its shores. The explosion could have contributed to distributed the salt across a wide area, possibly creating high salinity soil that prevented crops from growing and resulted in the abandonment of cities all along the Jordan Valley for centuries. Or writes that people have passed down the accounts in spectacular disaster or his oral histories over the generations, providing the basis for the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so what's interesting about this is that the archaeologists didn't don't normally bring in people to study types of activity that they ended up having because again they needed to bring in people who actually study comets and meteors and what they found was that again these rocks and this wasn't necessarily the the most comprehensive article this was from smithsonian so it was a little bit more for for um public consumption when when you read the descriptions of the the rocks that were found there and how they were formed they only could have been formed from a from from a, a burst an air burst of a comet it's the only way that this could have happened so it's not just that like the places were destroyed they could have only been destroyed in the way that the essentially the bible describes it to the effect of of what would have happened when that air burst would have happened one of the first things that would have happened was that everybody would have been blinded even before the shock wave came through and destroyed all of it they actually would have been blinded and that's what's so interesting about the story is it actually says the blinding the blinding the blinding of um one of the one of the effects would have been that everyone would have been blinded and so this was preserved in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's what's so amazing about the Testament that we have, which is again, that it came from the sky that it was raining down. It wasn't just a fire. And so this is a really, really critical description of, of a scientific occurrence that we now know happened. And we, we know it happened. So there's no question that it happened. And I, and I believe that the Sodom and Gomorrah story was a Jewish way of retelling that story so that people would be would take it to heart and would actually learn something from it. Again, it's one thing that it happened. That's amazing. But it shouldn't surprise us at this point. It really shouldn't that the stories of the Bible that are recounted, including, as we said, one of the most disastrous and memorable things like the flood, the archaeology and the geology of our world tells us that these things happen. The question is, is how do we understand them? What, what, do we, what lessons do we take away? And from this, a version of the story is that, of course, if the cities deserve to be destroyed, one of the things that the Bible tells us is that innocent people were not destroyed there. We don't like the idea. We don't like the idea that God would destroy innocent people. So that's one of the key things about this story, that when you go back and say, why do we have this story? Well, now that we know that this really happened, Okay, just take what we know now, which is that this really happened. One of the critical lessons that we now know after September, three months ago, is that the Jewish takeaway is that God wouldn't let innocent people be destroyed, that somehow God sent angels there to get the people out. That's one thing that, again, that tells us that we, we believe in a God that doesn't want innocent people to die in a natural disaster. I'm just saying, take that away. The other thing is, is that God didn't want people to, to be destroyed, that God actually wants to see if there's a way to save them, right? And of course, that Lot participates in this in some way, but again, there's no, there's no way for this not to happen to some extent, because these people have proven themselves to be without any merit at all. So, 
the story that we're left with is one that teaches us that we have a merciful God who wants us to not be destroyed, and that Abraham, as the first Jew, is also concerned with their welfare, their well-being. So if the story existed and we knew that there was a story, and everyone knew that Sodom and Gomorrah was, was destroyed, look at how the Jewish people put the context to it. And with, again, this buildup that I've already given you, come back next Tuesday morning to read the story of Judges, which I believe was also based on a real story, the real story, not the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but what happens when people are left to do justice. What happens when people try to do what God does here, which is essentially wipe out really bad places? Keep that in mind, because again, it's a story in Judges that most people don't know, but most likely is a real story that really happened and that freaked people out. And that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is essentially a backstory to explain why what happened in Judges was so bad. So uh, if you're not going to be with us next Tuesday, read Judges chapter 19 when we're done tonight and, and take a look at that story. It's The two stories are completely based on each other. There's just no question. Now, um, here's the weird thing. Lot said he wanted to go to the cities of Tsar, and we're going to finish with this today. Did the Genesis story come first? Does the does the Genesis story come first? You mean? Yeah, versus the ju the judges story. Uh, I actually believe that the judges story actually happened was the story that happened, and then the 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 Jewish version, if you will, of Sodom and Gomorrah was changed was was not changed but was told it's a mythological story so you essentially can can tell it the way you want to tell it the way the story of song more was told was based on the story from judges so i think that the story of judges happened and then the and then the version of of genesis that we have was based on the fact that people wanted to give you a reason why what happened in Judges was so bad. So it's not a coincidence. I mean, there's clearly, the, the stories are clearly not coincidental. And uh, when you read them side by side, you see that they're completely, they're completely connected. So just keep that in mind is that I, I believe that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was widely known in the ancient Near East. I, th I think that people knew that these cities were destroyed, that these were cities that were destroyed in a powerful supernatural level event and that it was just too much for it not to be an act of god we still call them acts of god especially when we can't explain how you know we can't even understand that there's asteroids and comets and and and, and meteors and when you don't understand that there's objects in space that can do this kind of damage how can it not be supernatural and so that's the context that we phrased this, the way we, we did it. So let's look at Lot, because Lot, there's a lot about Lot. And, and this story is uh, much deeper than some people realize, because it doesn't end with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The story actually is also a very important story. Again, an etiology, a story that explains why things are. We're about to read about why certain people are the way they are. So let's read. And it's the last few verses of the story. So it's not a lot, but it's a story within a story. And to some extent, maybe even to some extent, the purpose of the story to get us to this next part. When you think about it, the relevance of it. So it says that Lot went up from Tsoar and settled in the hill country with his two daughters. For he was afraid to, deal, to dwell in Tsoar. And he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Now, he says he wants to go to Tsar. He still wants to live in the city, but he can't. He says he was afraid to live there. So he is amazingly, as we read the story now, we're, we're very, well, first of all, we've read this story. We're not letting other people tell us the story. You've read the story. You've read it. It's in its entirety. And you understand now that Lot's a lot more complex than maybe you thought. And that he lost some of his family already. Well, we knew he lost his wife, but now he lost, seems to have lost his children, maybe grandchildren in Sodom. He is, uh, as we would say today, suffering from PTSD. 
I mean, he's afraid. He can't live in Soar. He wanted to live in Soar. He was afraid to kind of live outside of a city. He likes, seems to like the cities, right? You know, he was supposed to be a, a farmer, herdsman. He was supposed to be a, a guy like, like Avraham, a nomad. He was not supposed to be living in a city. He was not supposed to be a town guy, but he likes it, but he can't live there anymore. And so he's living up in a cave with his two daughters, which is spooky. I mean, it's a spooky, scary, it's not, you know, he's hiding in a cave, which by the way, you know, could have gone, maybe live near Abraham again, but he doesn't. He lives in a cave with his two daughters. It's going to get weirder. The older one said to the younger, our father is old and there is not a man on earth who can consort with us in the way of, of all the world. Come, let us make our father drink wine. And let us lie with him that we may maintain life through our father. That night they made their father drink wine and the older one went and lay with their father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And the next day, the older one said to the younger, see, I lay with father last night. Let's make him drink wine tonight also. And you will go lie with him that we maintain life through our father. Yep. That night they also made their father drink wine and the younger one went and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down and when she arose. And thus the two daughters of Lot came to be with a child by their father. The older one bore a son and named him Moab. He's the father of the Moabites of today. And the younger one bore a son and called him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. And they lived happily ever after. That's the end of the story. Um, we will return back to Abraham next week, but we're not, of course, not going to leave it with that because we have to explain why did that just happen? Why did we just have this horrible end to an already horrible story? Um, the Ammonites and Moabites, two of our cousins, if you will, that live on the other side of the Jordan River, we know we have problems with them later on. We've been reading about them in the book of Judges. We'll read about them again in the book of Samuel. They are uh, occasionally, we're going to war against them. They are, uh, the Moabites, the ones who King Balak hired Balaam to curse us. They're, they're not our friends, oftentimes. Um, sometimes they're our friends, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes we go to war with them. And they are not Israelites. They're not Jews. They're not even descendants of Abraham, but they're nephews, grandnephews of Abraham. In a very strange way, they are um, related. Not only are they related to us, they're in a very strange way related to each other and to their father slash grandfather. And this is not supposed to be a good thing understand that this is not speaking highly of the Ammonites and Moabites. It is intentionally meant to be uh, not complimentary, to put it mildly, to tell people that you're the product of an incestuous relationship is pretty much, even in the ancient world, uh, the worst thing you can tell somebody about where they came from. They're a product of their ancestor being raped by their own daughter it's hard to figure out a worse birth narrative for people and both peoples so did the Except we don't we have greek what? stories like that what we have greek stories like that oh we do you know, oh we and, do and also the egyptians married their brothers and sisters. Yeah. i don't know you're their father it is not meant to be something that the Israelites thought was okay. They clearly yeah. didn't think it was okay. They don't like this issue of him being essentially drunk and, and being taken advantage of by his family, which calls to mind the story of Noah, right? So Noah and Lot have that in common that they are uh, fall prey to some, to some extent to alcohol and to sexual impropriety at the very least once they're drunk. And so the Bible links uh, sex and alcohol from the very beginning uh, with these two stories. These two stories do not, um, you know, do not paint this 
uh, issue of alcohol consumption as something that can, uh, you know, be taken for granted, right? There's a consequence to it because it's only because he's drunk that he does that, that he allows this to happen. The assumption is, is that, I mean, it says a lot didn't know what happened. He didn't know what happened. And so that only could happen under the influence of alcohol. So it's not a good thing. It's, it's, it's clearly not good. Look, we don't know the Ammonite and Moabite uh, tales. We don't know how they told people how they came into being. We don't know how they talked about their origin stories. We don't, we kind of assume that, or we can, we can kind of assume that they, um, well, first of all, we know that they spoke a language which was almost indistinguishable from Hebrew. So they, they would have understood this story. They would have gotten this story. Uh, we know that the Ammonites marry into um, the Israelite people. Because we know that, uh, in fact, King Solomon marries an Ammonite princess. He marries lots of women, but one of them is an Ammonite. And she gives birth to his son, Rehoboam, who becomes king of, his, of, of well, ends up becoming just king of Judah. But he's king of, he's the monarch for a little while of everybody. So the, the King David's grandson is part Ammonite. Um, we know that Ruth the wonderful Ruth. We love Ruth. David's own great grandmother is a Moabite. So they're all, you know, they're in the neighborhood and they're not so separate from us that they don't pop up into our stories. But yet here we have these people that again, in our version, this is not a complimentary origin story. This is not the way you want to have it play out. We don't know what their stories are. We don't know how they talked about being related to each other. They're both on that side of the, the Jordan River. They don't know. We don't know how they played out their relation to Abraham or to, or to, uh, or to us, right? To the Israelites. I don't, I don't know when this is written, but it's interesting that, that we have these values before the Ten Commandments. Well, now we could, we could assume, I mean, the way that we project it is that we have these values obviously before, but uh, it could be again, it was written at a later time when, when, yeah. you know, we, we have it, but, but regardless, yeah. I mean, the point is, is that we, we believe, or we, we, we want to believe that Abraham had these values and that, um, that they can go, they can get twisted. Now, look, we have a story that Judah, our ancestor, every person who claims to be a Jew is related to, to is related to Judah, that Judah had sex with his daughter-in-law. Now it's not his flesh and blood. It was his daughter-in-law, but that we're descendants of a union between a guy who's not supposed to be having his daughter-in-law having sex with her and he had sex with her and we had that's our ancestry. So we have stories that are also not complimentary in our own Bible about our own selves. I mean, you know, we have stories like this. Uh, this one is like, you know, at another level, but if they're similar, I mean, they, they go, you know, we can, we can imagine that, you know, when we're telling these stories around the campfire that, you know, if you want to make one a little bit worse, but we don't know the Ammonite and Moabite story. Maybe the Ammonites and Moabites said that they were descendants of Abraham himself. Maybe our version is saying, yeah, you're not, you're not Abraham's direct descendant, but you're, you're a descendant of Lot. You're, you're in the family because you're our cousins. You know, you're, you're related through Terach. We're, we're all B'nai Terach, but we're not B'nai Avraham. But maybe they thought that they were B'nai Avraham. We don't know. It says Avraham is the father of many nations. The Bible clearly says, I'm telling you in Genesis, we're going to get to it, that he's the ancestor of the Midianites who live on the other side and who's Again, we know that Moses' wife and uh, you know her father Yitro are Midianites. We know that they're descendants of Abraham. So, and there are enemies at some points too. So Midianites can be they're B'nai Avraham. So they're in the proximity. The Bible is not saying that these people are totally different from us. They're 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 around, you know, and they're and they're not, you know, they're close. Um, the story is not a good story. The whole story. <laughs> is not a good story. And interestingly, the last part of it is maybe the most relevant part because there were no people of Sodom and Gomorrah left anymore. They're gone. They're done. They're burned up. But they're Moabites and Ammonites and they're living all around us, right? They're living next door. They're right across the river. And sometimes they're living in our own neighborhood. 
And when you're talking about a Mammonite and Moabite, you look at him and you go, <laughs> his, his ancestor is a guy who slept with his daughter. Oh my gosh, they're, they're such icky, creepy people. That's the relevance to this. And that's why these stories are like, when you think about it, a whatever mythology is here, the practical aspect and the application of this is that people in the Israelite community would have looked over at the Ammonites and Moabites and laughed at them and said, yeah, these are weird. And I don't want to call them hillbillies because that's not the point. We don't want to say that about anybody, uh, especially again, uh, to use that for, for uh, people in modern day, but uh, we make jokes about people being inbred today and it has the same power as it did in the ancient world. Believe me when I tell you, it was not the way things were, were supposed to have gone down. And so we're left with this story, which, wow, at the end of the story, that's where it goes, that the last three surviving people from Sodom and Gomorrah give rise to it. So yes, there's a definitely similarities that we have in Greek mythology. There's definitely stories in Greek mythology that want to give rise to how did these people get to here? How did the how did the Trojan, how did this, the re last remnants of the Trojan War out wind up in, in Italy fi founding the Roman Empire? I mean, there are stories like this. There are important stories in the, in the Aeneid, you know, the, 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 the Greco Roman stories that would explain why a city is called this city. We have the city of Soar gets named here. We have the Ammonites and Moabites. So there's takeaways from the story. That it, when we talk about it of today, when it says Ad Hayom, that Soar is known by this name today, the Moabites and the Ammonites of today, Ad Hayom, this wasn't ancient history. This wasn't just mythological history of people who don't exist anymore. These are your neighbors. These are the people that you interact with. Just remember where they come from. So these were important stories. These were not, these were not just throwaway uh, myths that people would say around the campfire and say, these are ancient stories. These are lessons for today. And they are, they are to some extent, even if you will, political um, propaganda and, and hit pieces for why people are the way they are. And uh, kind of why, why you got to be a little, um, uh, you gotta, you gotta be a little careful of those, of those uh, Ammonite and Moabite people. But as I told you before, Ruth is a Moabite, right? She's a descendant of these people. So you can't laugh too hard because if you're a descendant of King David, which most likely you are, you got a little Moabite blood in you too. If you're a descendant of King Rehoboam, you got a little Ammonite blood in you too. So don't laugh too hard and don't, and don't uh, disparage these groups too much because there's a little bit of that floating around in us, according to this story, if that's the takeaway. So um, and Ruth seems to be a really, really good person. She's one of the, she's one of the true hero heroes or heroines of, of the Bible. So it doesn't mean that everybody in that group is bad. It doesn't mean that, 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 you know, these people are people we laugh at or this, you know, disregard because, um, by the way, that means that if the Messiah is a descendant of King David, the Messiah is a descendant somewhat of the Moabites as well. Interesting, because, of course, as Christians will do next week as they read the, the birth narratives, especially the one found in Matthew, at least according to that, he's a descendant of King David, which means he's got a little Moabite, a little Moabite blood in him as well. So uh, keep that in mind, folks, or at least his genealogy, I wouldn't say within him. But uh, I apologize for, again, uh, the fact that we, I can't, I can't make you uh come on tuesdays but if you want to watch afterwards you'll have a chance to uh hear our discussions online we'll definitely post up on facebook uh it'll be up and i'll post it up on youtube the discussion for next tuesday's um uh, next tuesday's uh beyond the torah as we look at judges and we're finishing up Judges, which is, like, as I've said many times, is my, one of my favorite books of the Bible, not because it's filled with, with fun stories or happy stories, but it, the stories in there are really powerful. The story of Samson that we finished yesterday is one of the, the most powerful, tragic, and um, I think to some, to some degree is one of the most relevant stories in the Bible. And um, yeah, you can listen to the Samson discussions from the last two weeks. Folks, please join us this 
Friday night, uh, we have services at 8 p.m. with Rick and Addy. Myself will be live, will be streaming. Uh, at eight o'clock from our temple. We hope to see you. We're going to have some great music. Uh, we're working on the songs that we're going to be doing for for uh, for uh, for a Friday night. And I really hope that we can uh, see you or have you be part of it, either again in person or or uh, or by streaming um, that that week. And again, oh, and, and, and yes. talking about movies like we were earlier, uh, the best movie ever played ever made is actually going to be on the big screen on January 23rd, Casablanca. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be at the Edwards. Many people say that. I will tell I will you, be you there. Know, I thought you were going to say, as soon as you said the best movie ever made, I knew you weren't going to say it, but many people, and I can't promote it officially because it's on Shabbat, but the following Friday on the 24th is the Fiddler on the Roof at the Lemley, and I think they sold out. If they haven't sold out... No, it's not sold out. out. It's almost sold out. It's almost sold out. Yeah, but when was the last time you checked, Mike? It might be sold uh, out. Now. Earlier today. Okay. Earlier today. So there are still tickets. Only the front section is actually I free. I can't recommend it, but you're going to be with a lot of the Jewish community. Of you no, know, it's going to be a really good service. There's going to be a lot of Jews there. We'll, we'll sell... We'll, we'll have a Make, kid, make Kiddush and, and bring some challah there. Do a, yeah, bro- do a bracha over the popcorn. All right, everybody. <laughs> Stay good. Stay healthy, everybody. Take care. It's good to have you all tonight. Take care. Bye-bye.